Hey, everybody. Welcome to another episode of Purple Insider. Matthew Collar here, as always, and joining me in front of his Christmas tree, Brian Murphy, who I'm sure is in the spirit to talk about the Vikings falling to the Cincinnati Bengals. And you know what's funny, though, Murph, is that because the Green Bay Packers lost in the way that they did to the Tampa Bay Bucks, the Vikings still have over a 50 percent chance to make the playoffs and even some combinations of them only winning one of the final three games still get them into the playoffs, which feels very awkward to talk about after the way that they came apart in the second half, particularly the fourth quarter against the Cincinnati Bengals. So just add that to the weirdness overall of the season. Yeah. An eight and nine playoff berth. Wouldn't that be fun to get on the train of, I, I, I feel like we've been saying this now for a while as this quarterback carousel has kind of played there's no way to predict there's no way to prepare there's no way to digest everything that's going to be happening with this team for the next couple of weeks because it really is a drive-by drive situation right now i mean i'm sure o'connell's going to face questions today about whether he's going to stick with nick mullins or he's going to go to the rookie i don't necessarily think that's you know the wise move to make at this point you still have a guy that as bad as mullins looked at times he still was fairly accurate. I mean, you know, I, yeah, he had the two interceptions and of course a pick six negated by an offsides penalty still threw for 300 yards, still threw for two touchdowns. They weren't pretty, but they did look, they put together some sustainable sustained drives. This is as good as it's going to get. I think I, if you, if you switch gears again and, and hook your game plan up to an unprepared rookie, I don't know what that's going to mean for this week. I don't know that what that's going to mean for, now you're going up against the division leading Detroit Lions. Uh, you're, I think Mullins gives you the best chance to win, but as as this quarterback scenario has played out this season, and as it's going to continue to play out, there's really nothing Kevin O'Connell can do more than just throw up his hands, call the plays that he can. We we can go over the the failed tush pushes, and we can go over some other goal line calls as well. But the reality is. He doesn't know what he's going to get out of his quarterback. None of us know what anybody, none of us know what any quarterback taking a snap for the Vikings from here until the end of the season is really going to be capable of. So you're just going to have to endure. Well, I'll ask you uh, sort of the big question coming out of the game. And then I want to talk about this week more because when the game's on Saturday, I feel like we have by now uh, kind of, pounded all the things into the ground from should this have happened should this player have pushed the tush or not hey you know maybe maybe the issue is that Nick Mullins needs to work the glutes a little bit more right I mean that's what they talk about with uh Jalen Hurts that he could squat so much or whatever I don't know usually people get first downs on quarterback sneaks uh but the big question coming out from a lot of fans is about Kevin O'Connell and whether there should be considered cracks in the foundation or questions about him a little bit more than than there would have been a couple of weeks ago in the game management the play calling and so forth and I have been very hesitant to go there and that upsets some people who uh, who I think want to react to what we've seen and and I also think that you could talk about some elements of that and say you know hey there was a questionable one here a questionable one there I don't know what coach that doesn't pertain to but uh, tell me tell me how you view that because I think that there's reacting to they called a play in the moment that didn't work and it was the wrong call because it didn't work but I don't think we have to make it into way more than it actually is Well, if you want to talk about a crack in a foundation, that was when, you know, Kirk Cousins Achilles cracked open on October 29th in Green Bay. I mean, that that was the crack in the foundation. There was another crack in the foundation when Justin Jefferson pulled his hamstring and was lost for eight weeks. There was a crack in the foundation when, you know, we realized that Josh Dobbs isn't going to be a savior. I mean, yeah, there's always going to be nitpicking. And I, I agree going back to the well on the tush push a second time with your five foot eight you know, 180 pound running back as your main push uh, wasn't going to probably bear any more fruit. I know they were trying to get too cute with trying to keep Cincinnati's large personnel spread out a little bit more and whatnot, a little bit overthinking it. Um, but, you know, you get two cracks to get, you know, a half a foot. 
you think you can get that. I get I get the scrutiny, but as far as like a big picture, this is O'Connell losing control. This is O'Connell in over his head. This is O'Connell uh, wilting under the pressure of the moment. Look, you put any head coach in a position where he's starting four different quarterbacks in a season, all with different skill sets, backgrounds, and all with flaws, some fatal, that have rendered them journeymen and backups, you're going to get disjointed results. Um, I'm a little more concerned now. You know, we've been lauding, you know, we've been lauding this defense for several weeks, but there's some cracks in the foundation there late in games. Uh, is that in is that on Flores? Is that on the personnel? Uh, where they're just not able to make that really big play at the last, you know, the on the some of their last stands. And those have, you know, coughed up victories in Denver, coughed up a possible victory against Chicago, and then again on Saturday. So this is, you know, it's a stressed defense that's probably, that's been overachieving all year, but you've got an offense that can't, you know, pick up a, a dagger first down in the fourth quarter, puts more tremendous pressure on on your defense to win the game. They haven't been able to do that a couple of times. You've got a seven and seven team. I mean, you've got a seven and seven team that reflects the chaos that they've had offensively. And, you know, O'Connell's got call plays that he would like to call with particular quarterbacks, I don't think he, you know, maybe trust Nick Mullins, you know, in a play action in a big moment like that. Look, I don't know. We're not in any of their heads. We can probe and prod as much as we can. But I think O'Connell is just spinning so many plates right now. There's going to be a few that crash once in a while. I I would not view any uh, cracks in Kevin O'Connell's foundation. I would say he's just managing, a, you know, a fractured roster, a fractured scheme, and he's essentially playing the hand he's dealt as best he can. Yeah. You know, it felt very much like, so I used to do a post game show in Buffalo and they, during that time they had Ryan Fitzpatrick, EJ Manuel, Kyle Orton and Tyrod Taylor. I think were the quarterbacks that I mainly was reacting to in post game and the calls post game calls were mostly about coaching decisions because they're very easy to evaluate. I think like they stand out so much when we watch a game. And so like they made a decision, it worked or it didn't work. And that's what we can talk about. Right. Uh, but at the end of the day, the bills ended up way better than when I was there doing post game, when they had Josh Allen playing quarterback and, and then their post games turned into celebrations uh, of their quarterback for the most part, as opposed to, Hey, why didn't they run this play or that play? And, and I'm sure there's, you know, the same questioning when they lose there of different play calls and everything else. Uh, I just mean that when it's Tyrod Taylor or when it's EJ Manuel, the margin for error is so thin. So if Jake Browning throws up a balloon into the air and T Higgins comes down with it, then you lose and there's nothing you can really do there uh, because your quarterback turned the ball over in the red zone two times when they could have had easy field goals and been running away with the game. And uh, yeah, I know you could say, well, Cincinnati has a backup quarterback and that's, but that's the sort of the point is like their backup quarterback has had a couple weeks where it's clicking and next week, Jake Browning might throw four interceptions, but this week he gets to go to the podium and talk trash about the Vikings. But next week it might be a disaster. And you know what I was thinking Murph, because I'm always the big picture thinker, which has irritated some people throughout the season. But Justin Jefferson and Jordan Addison sure made Nick Mullins look great on a lot of occasions during that game. I mean, Jefferson made some all universe type of catches that had no business. Even the refs didn't think he caught it on one of them. I have no idea how Jordan Addison caught either one of his touchdowns. The one is a shoestring catch that he goes down at full speed to grab. The other one, I don't even know where Nick Mullins was throwing the football and Addison's arms just come out of nowhere and snatch it and I'm sitting there thinking man you know the next quarterback here has a pretty good setup with all of this uh, receivers were open throughout the day they had the first running day where they were dominant in a really long time and and so there's like this two parts of me that goes you know what they really let this one get away and this is a really bad loss but at the same time would you look at some of this stuff on offense you know like just just look at it but I also think it did reveal that on defense, Brian Flores has been squeezing this and squeezing this and squeezing this 
but they're going to need at some point more talent if they're going to have a true like top five type of defense. I think it's been overachieving. It's been, as you said, very stressed that it was bound to break based on who they've been relying on. Uh, and that it's just sort of evidence of like this team has some ways to go. The offense is set up perfectly for the next quarterback. The defense is going to need some work still, I think. Folks, we are going all in on prize picks this football season. Every week we are playing and testing out our skills here on Purple Insider to see if we could predict what numbers players will put up every Sunday. If you haven't heard of it, trust me, you're going to want to check it out. Prize picks is the easiest and best way to play daily fantasy. Instead of battling against thousands of other players and people who spend their entire lives doing fantasy all you do is pick more or less on between two and six player stat projections so say a quarterback's number is 250.5 yards go more or less and bang you are playing and you can pick from hundreds of players and numbers this football season the cool thing is that it's quick and easy and does not cost an arm and a leg you can turn ten dollars into 250 just like that. Again, the perfect way to fit it into a busy day. Click, click, and you're playing. This isn't just something that I like. You're going to hear us doing every single week prize picks on the show on Purple Insider. So go to prizepicks.com slash purple and use the code purple for a first deposit match up to $100. That's prizepicks.com slash purple with the code purple. Daily fantasy sports made easy. Right, and we don't even know if Brian Flores is going to be there to to kind of keep shepherding that unit to its its greatest potential. But you're right. I mean, you look at Akilah Akilah Evans comes up just short on that T Higgins play at the pylon. That's a that's an NFL Pro Bowl play that Higgins made. Not only going up to get the ball, coming down with both feet in bounds, and having the wherewithal to stretch around and and catch uh, break the plane over the pylon. I mean, that's that's a highlight play. You know, Evans was there. He was in coverage. He didn't make the play. Now, does a shutdown corner that you draft higher or you a, a veteran like Patrick Peterson maybe makes that play? Yeah, you could make that argument that he does. The fact that he was actually in position to make that play and the, you had an NFL receiver make an NFL Pro Bowl receiving type play, you just have to live with that. And again, why is that in that position? Because, you know, why can't Mullins – you know, convert in the red zone. He had his receivers bailing him out time after time. But as you mentioned, they were clicking offensively for the first time, really, I think since the New Orleans game, or at least it felt like when they had the ball, they were a threat to do something, as opposed to most of the last month, it's been, can they get a few first downs and drain some clock so that the defense can catch their breath and figure out what they need to do next? You know, that that 12 play 75 yard drive to start the game was quite impressive. I I would not have predicted that. I mean, I'm I've been thinking that 16 to 13 is going to be their requisite victory margin because it's going to be, you know, put in the hands of their defense. Well, now I see a little bit more. I see I see a little bit more, at least scheme wise, where you're right. They have two great receivers. Hawkinson was in in play. Chandler came in coming in for Madison, 130 plus yards. You know, you're wondering why maybe he couldn't get the ball on the fourth down play, uh, you know, in overtime. A lot of those things, are at least for positive influences, that they can build upon, and that's why I have a I have a pretty good suspicion that you know O'Connell's going to going to stay with Mullins because there are some building blocks that you can at least you know use going forward and game plan for another week. Give Mullins another week to kind of digest and and assume his role. And look, the Lions is as as decent as they have been all season. They've been carried by their offense because they're they're pretty prolific, and we know what they can do. We know what Goff's been able to do, but their defense has been suspect at times. So, and it's a Lions Vikings game, and weird things always happen with the Lions and the Vikings, especially in Minnesota. I think the, you know, the Vikings have been able to torment the Lions and Dan Campbell even in recent years at U.S. Bank Stadium. Um, I think you know this may be more evenly matched than we think, and then of course the Vikings know the stakes are so high, but I. I just feel like it's it's very difficult with what we've seen in the last two weeks, the last four weeks, the last eight weeks to really understand what this team is because we know what they're somewhat capable of and limited to. But every game that you see something positive and negative and you look and you, you just throw up your hands. I mean, there's just really no way 
with such unpredictable quarterback play and, you know, sort of an unproven defense that, that can shine at moments, but reveal itself to be sort of the inexperienced overachieving unit. You just have no sense of what this team's going to be able to do drive by drive quarter by quarter, which makes it impossible to look away, but it just also makes it very difficult to digest because you know, it's going to be a difficult, difficult journey every game. You know, I was thinking about this after the game that how many times has even any backup quarterback put up 424 yards of offense? I mean, it doesn't happen all that often. And aside from like, if you were losing the game the whole time, which they weren't like, so you're, you're in control, you're leading the whole game and you put up over 400 yards of offense. How often does that team ever lose? Right. I mean, most of the time you would expect to win. And it's, that's what it comes down to is just a couple of plays, which made it really difficult to analyze. I think because those plays made it, made them lose. They lost the game. That's what happened. We can't pretend it, it didn't, but on a play to play basis, they were the better team for the vast majority of that game. And I don't, it's like hard to ask for a lot more of that when you are playing Nick Mullins, who came into the game with a five and 12 career record, mostly playing for the San Francisco 49ers. So it's not like he was playing for, you know, Cleveland or something. Well, I think he had one game with Cleveland. It's not like he, he was playing for some terrible franchise or something. He was playing for a really good one uh, when they struggled so much. So, all right, let's, let's get into the, the lions part of this, uh, this, Had Kirk been around, this might have felt really cool, even if their record was the same, even if they were seven and seven. And we maybe would have talked about, hey, look, look, they were all in three at one point and now they're still, you know, controlling their own destiny for the playoffs. It's very rare that teams make the playoffs after going 0 and three. And yet they have this chance. So if Kirk was the quarterback, I think we'd be going this is actually like an exciting situation with the Vikings and Lions. Like it's been a really long time since the Lions have been relevant. They've got to beat the Packers in here at some point to make the playoffs. Like this is this is really tense and really interesting. I think what Mullins throwing those interceptions sort of gave us was like, oh, you know, this team probably doesn't have enough juice to really go anywhere, even if they make the playoffs. So, okay, I guess we'll just see what happens. But even if they win that game against the Bengals, we're probably going like, oh, wow, look, maybe Mullins is the guy who's, you know, operating the offense the way O'Connell wants. And they're going to play top offense versus top offense here or something. It's just one or two plays can really change the way we view this game. So I don't think that right now from the fans, they're getting super juiced up for this game. But At the same time, if you win it, you've got a great, great chance to make the playoffs and it would restore all of that. Like the Cincinnati loss would be quickly forgotten if you beat the top team in the division and presumably have to play really well offensively or defensively to do it. Yeah, I mean, as you look at you, we're 14 games into this, right? So everybody's had to endure seven losses and, you know, hang on for seven wins. If you're really going to pull the pin now and just say, you know what, it's useless. Uh, Even if they make it, they're not going to last long. And look, I don't think anybody expects them to roll in at nine and eight, 10 and seven at best, but most likely nine and eight. Or you even mentioned an eight and nine scenario where they could kind of back in. Nobody sees them going on the road and taking care of business and moving on. Just as last year, we were blindsided a little bit uh, by how badly they played against the Giants. We should go in with eyes wide open. Uh, of what they have the potential to do, but it still doesn't, I mean, at this point, there's no sense in just laying down. I mean, there's, it really doesn't benefit you as much anymore because your record is so close to 500. Anyway, the tank, the tank campaign, if there was one should have been six weeks ago, if you've endured all of this, the quarterback drama, a three, nothing atrocity in Vegas, if you've endured all of what you've seen and all the emotional roller coaster that you've been on, since about week six, you might as well see it through, right? And seeing it through means, you know, you have two chances against the division leader. Again, the North isn't really in play, but you can really dictate your your destiny in the playoff hunt, and you can put the final nail in the coffin on your, your arch nemesis on New Year's Eve. So it's almost like, it's like you're going into a fun house, I feel like, these next three weeks, because it's very rare that you see an opponent twice in three weeks and there's some scenarios out there where they could actually play the Lions in the first round. 
Could you imagine seeing an opponent three times in four weeks and what kind of grudge matches and what kind of trends you're going to see coming out of that? Which, by the way, in the 60 years, these two teams have been in the same division, having grown up in Detroit. I can't remember a significant Vikings-Lions game in my lifetime. So there's something a little bit new and fresh in that. It's just you might as well enjoy it. You know, you might as well sit back and just you just don't know what you're going to see this season in the NFL because of the backup quarterbacks, because of the one score games and the differentials and the wide open playoff races. I know they're wide open every year, but it just feels like this year there's just a lot of um, especially in the NFC. There's a there's a lot of potential for some just random things to happen that, you know, just enjoy. I know I, I've been saying this for three years as we've been doing this together, Collar, it just feels like every week is an incredibly new, different package to unwrap with narratives and trends and consequences and potential for rosters, for potential for jobs, for potential for playoff berths, not playoff berths. What will what will happen when they're in? What are the wild card scenarios? I I, I just I just find it the the greatest unscripted entertainment and it, they never seem to fail. This franchise never seems to fail going into the final few weeks of setting expectations that I don't even know if they can achieve. I don't even know if it's worth setting expectations because we don't know again, what they're going to be able to do offensively with a, any given quarterback for the next couple of weeks. So to me, fretting about what may happen to them in the first round or fretting about, what would happen if they finished seven and 10 compared to nine and eight? Probably not much. So I don't think you're going to solve your quarterback problem in the next couple of weeks with Mullins or if they go back to Dobbs or they go to Hall. It's not going to all come into a clear focus. So just sort of enjoy the moment, I guess. Yeah, I, I think that when we got to the bye week, and I, I know that other people wrote this, I kind of wrote this like, you know, this five weeks at the end of the season could really shape how they feel about the quarterback situation and, and things like that. I, I'm not even sure that that's even really true, right? Like now, now that we've, we've seen Nick Mullins, I mean, maybe if they go for 400 yards and beat Detroit and get the win, uh, we could come away saying, man, if Nick Mullins could put up back to back 400 yard games, but we are always dealing with this small sample size whiplash. And there's no better example than Detroit where two weeks ago, Detroit loses to Chicago. And I see in Chicago, they're starting to say, well, wait, wait, they could maybe stay with Justin Fields and Hey, you know, Detroit, like they're showing these, these problems and maybe their offense is falling apart late in the season. And then Detroit comes out and just hits the turbo rocket boosters against a Denver defense. That's not that bad. Uh, that's turned it around in the second half of the season and they run them out of the building. Like Jameer Gibbs is looking like a superstar. They're getting Jamison Williams involved. Amon Ross St. Brown is playing great. Jared Goff suddenly just snaps back out of it. Whatever trance he was in for a couple weeks, he's firing the ball all over the place. You go like, uh, okay, I guess two weeks ago we thought, eh, you know, maybe these Detroit games and then, oh, wait, no, maybe not these Detroit games uh, this year. And you're right that every year is like this, but this year it feels like the NFC has been so open outside of the first couple of spots, but even those everyone except for San Francisco has big flaws. Even, even the good teams, we saw it from Dallas. We've seen it from Philadelphia that there is more of an, any given Sunday part of this where you think that Detroit could be the best team and blow you out of the building, or they could completely fumble versus Brian Flores, defense and, then lose at us bank stadium. I mean, we saw them last year. They were right in position to beat the Vikings had something like a 95% chance to win that game late. And they end up blowing it because they don't cover KJ Osborne. He goes for a touchdown. Uh, that's just the world we live in. And I was adding this up last night, Murph. It's like 75% of games that the Vikings play that come down to one score and one drive. And I was feeling this in Cincinnati, like, you know what? I don't. E I don't even have an elevated heart rate anymore at the end of these games. I am so used to this that this is just. I'm so used to. I stopped even trying to write my game story during the game, and I write it as more of a narrative of how I was feeling at the moment because I used to have to rewrite it so often. Like I'd be writing, "Oh, Vikings win." Oh, wait, they blew whatever lead, or "Oh, they lose," or what? You know what I mean? So, 
uh, it's, uh, it's, it's just, it's just been like that. And that's just the world that we're living in. So I have no idea what's coming next. And I don't even know what I'm supposed to think of the Detroit lions. It's like people, I think want our analysts to be very like, this is, this is what's going to happen. This is the truth. But in this case, I don't know. I think Detroit is a really good football team overall, the larger sample. I think they're much better than the Vikings in the larger sample, but in two games at the end of a season, who knows what could happen? I don't think anything happened in Cincinnati that made me go season over. They can't win any more games. They're totally dusted. Forget this team. Just, you know, go, go to your holiday parties. I, I, I don't, I don't feel like that. Well, I almost felt like that after the Raiders atrocity. I mean, even though they won, that felt like a devastating loss. I mean, if you look at the emotions and the way they played, I mean, you could make the argument that, you know, it, it's interesting that the, the Raiders and Bengals game ended up washing. I kind of thought, man, if they're going on the road, they're probably going to split these two. I could not have predicted which game they would have won and which one they would have lost in the manner in which they won and lost. I mean, so <laughs> that's the that's the unpredictability of this. And you mentioned the Lions, too. I mean, the Lions have been kind of in a prove-it mode for a long time. I mean, they got hot at the end of last season. They obviously bounced Aaron Rodgers and the Packers out of the playoffs on the final Sunday night of the year and, you know, basically drove Rodgers out of Green Bay. And that was, you know, made of a, a big deal was made of that. Detroit had all the momentum in the offseason, all the positive vibes. They walk into Kansas City on the opening Thursday night and take down the Super Bowl champion Chiefs kind of a, hey, you know, the Lions are for real. And, you know, all along the way, they've showed glimpses of being a an NFC elite team while also having stubbed their toes at just the wrong moments against the wrong opponents to to make you think and, and, and give you, it, when I say you, I mean the broader NFL community, are the Lions really for real? And you know, as much as they make, you know, beat back against that reputation, it's probably seeping in the locker room. This is still an unproven team. It's still a, a conference where people are talking about Philadelphia as much as Dallas looked terrible in Buffalo. They're still talking Dallas and they're still talking San Francisco. So again, there's always that sense of waiting for the other shoe to drop for the Lions. So you don't know how they're going to go into the last two out of three, knowing that, you know, the Vikings, they're decades long tormentors you know, they got to come to U.S. Bank Stadium first, and I think that's key. If this game were in Detroit, uh, I'd feel a little bit more uneasy for the Vikings, but the Vikings have always played Detroit tough at home. The Lions still have a lot at stake. They know that the division is generally theirs, but it's still, I think, they need to show themselves, their fan base, that they're not just going to wander into the postseason. They're going to roll into the postseason, and to do that, they're going to have to take care of the Vikings twice. And the Vikings know, obviously, that every game from here on out is a playoff game for them. And because of those high stakes and because of the fact that neither team is really predictable, certain, um, there's really nothing you can bank on. I just feel like we are, again, if you're, a, if you're a fan, you're probably like, I wish this was a lot easier. But, I mean, you could be a Cardinals fan. You could be a Panthers fan. Uh, you know, you could be looking on the out you could be on the outside looking in and lamenting these games don't mean anything so as as thin as seven and seven feels it doesn't feel as catastrophic after they left cincinnati because they you just sense that the vikings can be in any game and make something happen in any moment but also anything can happen to them at any moment so where else you know where else would you rather be on the entertainment spectrum yeah, I remember Mike Zimmer talking to us about this one time uh, because Mike, people should know, uh, could be cantankerous at the podium sometimes, but we would have side sessions with him as reporters and uh, sometimes they would kind of go into Mike's story time about his days in Dallas or Cincinnati. And he was telling a story about uh, because when he was a defensive backs coach on a Dallas team that won the Super Bowl and he was talking about how uh, during that season, they were having some down moments and they got on a plane to go to a game thinking this might be the last time we all as a coaching staff get on this plane, like people are getting fired or whatever if we lose this game because the expectations are so high and everything else. And they got something like a kick return for touchdown to win the game, some sort of random event. And then they go on to win the Super Bowl. And he's like, that's that's the league. Like, that's how this all works is that it's always teetering 
on kind of one play here or there. Like when T Higgins whipped his arm out, I thought about Justin Jefferson in Philadelphia. And if Justin Jefferson scores and reaching his arm out instead of whips the ball to the back of the end zone, where are we at? And there's so many of these moments that just sort of rest on one play. And that's where it's really fascinating to relitigate, but very difficult uh, to predict when you have especially teams that are good, but maybe not necessarily great. So how much do you respect Detroit, Murph? Do you think that this is like, is this is this Detroit team a legit Super Bowl contender or are they a second tier or how are you feeling? I'm, I'm leaning more towards second tier. I, I need to see more. I need to see them, you know, put down the Vikings and put down the Vikings threat. I, see, I need to see them win 12, 12 games or more to really feel like they're a Super Bowl contender. Um, I think this is an important, they're progressing, you know, other than golf, this is still a relatively young team. So I feel like this is a team that's going to have to get some battle scars in the postseason. They haven't won a playoff game since 1991. So like, you know, baby steps here first, get your division, take, get a home game, win a home playoff game, put yourself in a position to go up against Philly, Dallas, or San Francisco on the road. And maybe you come out with a victory and maybe you get to the championship game and you're playing for a Super Bowl berth. I think that would be, you know, a pretty good ceiling. And then another another part of me is like, well, there's no the, the, this guarantees nothing. I mean, you could easily win 12 games and then, you know, fall back to, you know, six and not, you know, six and 11 next season. So I but I, I do feel like they're they're prepared to take a step. But to me, that step is mainly taking care of business the next couple of weeks, especially with your you know, they're going to have a home game on the seventh against the Vikings if there's still stakes there how to put down an opponent opponent and go into the playoffs with momentum and confidence. That's what I'm looking to see before I can put them in that top tier with Philly, Dallas, and San Francisco as Super Bowl contenders, but they're definitely knocking on the door. I think uh, as long as they have a fatal flaw of when Jared Goff gets pressured, he has so much trouble performing that it's going to be difficult to take them as seriously as some of the better teams especially considering who you have to play and how the other teams in the NFC could pressure the quarterback. But historically, if you get to 12 wins, I mean, you've got a pretty decent chance of going deep in the playoffs. So I think this will say a lot about both teams. It will say a lot about, you know, if Detroit can beat good Vikings teams twice and go into the playoffs with 12 wins or whatever, uh, they're going to be considered pretty scary. That means their offense will have really operated quite well. Uh, but if the Vikings beat them, then you're going to feel like, hey, a 6-3 matchup in a wild card weekend is sort of screaming Vikings beating New Orleans in 2019 or many of the other wild card weekend upsets that we've seen. So, yeah, I guess uh, I guess the, the message coming out of the episode here with us today, Murph, is like it felt pretty bad on Saturday, but. The, Could be the worse. Sun, <laughs> the sun, for some reason, keeps coming up for this team <laughs> every time we think it's about to explode into the stratosphere. So uh, thanks for your time, Murph, as always. And we will get together again after Vikings and Lions. Sounds good.